Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, millions of people in Somalia face the threat of starvation, conflict, prolonged drought and food prices that have been going up since the COVID-19 pandemic have seen the likelihood of famine draw ever closer. The Food and Agricultural Organization is particularly worried about its effect on those displaced by the pressures. Also, campaigning for Kenya's presidential elections picks up again after a deeply underwhelming presidential debate on Tuesday in which one of the front runners, Vice President William Ruto, appeared alone after his main rival skipped the television showdown. And Senegal heads to the polls on Sunday for legislative elections. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have taken a significant toll on the economy and the cost of living crisis is top of mind for most voters. But first, millions of people in Somalia face the threat of starvation. Conflict, prolonged drought and food prices that have been going up since the pandemic have seen the likelihood of famine draw ever closer. People living rurally are particularly vulnerable and are often forced to leave their communities in search of help. That displacement raises another set of problems. For a look, closer look at all of this, I'm joined now by Mr. Rain Paulson from the Food and Agricultural Organization, who's in Somalia meeting with drought affected communities. Rain, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, so how does what you've seen whilst in Somalia compare to the impact of Somalia's 2017 drought? So comparisons are always different, but I think we need to be crystal clear about the fact that Somalia today faces an unprecedented situation. In the last 40 years, uh, we have not had four failed rains um, as is the case uh, now. And I should say, as we look forward to the upcoming rainy season, there are real concerns about that too. And concretely what it means is that from the beginning of this year, January 2022 until now, we've gone from 2.4 million people to more than 7 million people in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. And you've also flagged up the, the, the need to support those who are fa also facing the effects of displacement. Now, it's obviously an important issue, but is it, it, it not a secondary consideration when, when looking at the risks of famine itself? So these things all go together. I mean, the Food and Agriculture Organization, our mandate, our expertise and our focus is working with rural uh, farming uh, populations. Um, and it's these populations that are bearing the brunt of uh, the famine situation, the unfolding food security situation in, um, uh, in Somalia. Um, this is uh, this is um, uh, 80 to 90 percent of uh, of the pop, uh, of the uh, uh, employment in in um, in Somalia relates to the agricultural sector. When livestock die, and since August last year, more than three million livestock have died in, in Somalia. When rains fail and crops don't thrive, people are forced to flee uh, to uh, uh, to find means of survival. So it's vital that uh, FAO and organisations that do similar work can scale up as we have to work in rural areas to meet immediate needs and to help avoid displacement. And I was speaking to somebody from your office a little earlier on, and they were, were pointing out something I thought was really interesting about the, the psychological effects of displacement whilst also tackling the, the very kind of existential um, uh, threats caused by famine as well. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that? So there's many, many dimensions. I've come back today from uh, Baidoa, um, uh, further, further inland from, from Mogadishu, where, I, uh, where I'm speaking to you from today, and I spoke with displaced uh, families. And what we've seen is in many cases, this is also a, a gendered crisis. Many of the people that are fleeing to urban areas are women fleeing with their children, uh, families being separated as they're finding uh, desperately trying to find ways to uh, survive. So you can imagine the uh, psychological uh, burden uh, associated with all of that, uh, the exposure that it places people in, in terms of um, uh, exploitation, uh, other challenges, all of which just underscores why we simply have to scale up urgently the work in rural areas to keep people close to their animals, to keep them uh, on their farms to allow them to produce locally where they normally live. Rain Paulson from the Food and Agricultural Organization, thank you so much for speaking to us today.
Now, Benin has freed 30 supporters of the political opposition who were arrested in last year's election that returned President Patrice Talon for a second term. The move came as French President Emmanuel Macron met with Talon in Cotonou on the second leg of a three country tour of Africa. On Wednesday, Talon had actually dismissed criticism of his treatment of political prisoners. He was first elected in 2016, and since then, opposition figures have accused him of persecution and of eroding the country's vibrant democracy. Campaigning for Kenya's presidential elections picked up again on Wednesday after a deeply underwhelming presidential debate on Tuesday. One of the front runners, Vice President William Ruto, appeared alone after his main rival, Raila Odinga, skipped the televised showdown. Vivian Wandera tells us more about how that went down with voters. Kenyans have been discussing Tuesday's presidential debate after two candidates failed to show up. Now, the deputy president, William Ruto, was left to tackle difficult questions on his own after his main contender, Raila Odinga, failed to show up for the debate. Now, Ruto was put to task over issues of corruption, the sources of his wealth, and what he's going to do to reduce the cost of living when he becomes the president. Now, some people believe he did a good job and some believe he did not perform so well, while some Kenyans actually support Odinga's decision to not attend the debate. This is what some Kenyans have to say. The debate was good. Ruto answered all the questions well, and I loved the way he was talking with courage. Raila really offended Kenyans, but it was his right to decide to attend or not to attend. We were happy because we expected Ruto would talk dishonestly. He always twists words. So we didn't want to involve Raila Rudinga with Ruto's propaganda. A day after the debate, the showdown between Raila Odinga and William Ruto continued as the two candidates headed out to central Kenya to garner more votes from the region. Now, the Mount Kenya region has been central in this election as it is the region with the highest number of votes in the country and will be the one to decide who becomes the president. This is not the first time the two candidates have had a face-off as they have both booked the same venue for their last rallies on August 6th, the Nyayo Stadium. Four protesters against the UN's peacekeeping mission in DR Congo were killed in the city of Uvira on Wednesday in DR Congo. Now, the unrest is rooted in frustration over the MINUSCO mission's lack of headway in tackling the country's instability. On Wednesday, clashes between the Congolese army and the M23 militia kicked off again in the country's east. Clashes have displaced more than 190,000 people since late March. Families survive in tough conditions and live in fear of further attacks. Meanwhile, hundreds of children have been separated from their parents. Our correspondents report. David is 12 years old. His village in North Kivu was attacked by the M23 armed group in mid-June. In the panic, he was separated from his parents and left on his own. As we were fleeing, people started shouting, the M23 are here. So everyone ran in different directions. I went on my own way, and that's when I realized that my parents were no longer there. I feel bad because I'm without my parents. I want to see them. In Kiwanja, Upedeko, a local NGO, looks after 15 unaccompanied children. Its employees use their contacts across the region to try to locate their parents. A task that often proves to be complicated as families are forced to flee multiple times. Sometimes you do the research, you find the family, you make the plans to reunite them with their child, but then the next day you realize that they are gone. This is very difficult because then you have to start again from scratch. According to the UN, some 500 children have been separated from their families since late March. But even for those who are still with their parents, daily life is a struggle. Every week, dozens of families fleeing violence come to this stadium in Rachuru. There are now 8,000 people here, including more than 6,000 children, all living in appalling conditions. Bahati fled Bunagana last month with his wife and four children. Look at what the children are wearing. This is all they have. There is no soap, there is no food. We tried to go back home to look for food, but the rebels made us leave. I'm scared. I'm scared we're going to starve, because if my children don't have enough to eat, they will die. 
These families live in fear of further attacks as the M23 threatens to seize more towns and cities across the region. The recent fighting has displaced more than 190,000 people since late March. In Burkina Faso, the family of the country's late president, Thomas Sankara, has called an apology letter from his exiled successor, Blaise Campaore, a parody. In April, Campaore was found to be complicit in Sankara's 1987 murder. Hanan Ferjani has more from Abidjan. Blaise Compaoré's plea for forgiveness has been met with criticism from Burkina Bay and other Africans, with many calling the apology statement insincere and tone deaf. In his letter, the former president, who's been living in exile in Ivory Coast since being removed from power by mass protests in 2014, asked the Burkina Bay people to forgive him for all the acts committed during his tenure, and especially, I quote, the family of my brother and friend, uh, Thomas Sankara. This specific part of the apology has sparked outrage Four months after Compaoré was sentenced to life for Thomas Sankara's murder during a coup that took place on October 15, 1987. Thomas Sankara's younger brother, Paul Sankara, said that the only way his apology can be accepted is if Compaoré serves his, his sentence in prison. But many observers are focused on the timing of the controversial apology, which comes a few weeks after Compaoré's visit to Burkina Faso, where he was invited by military leader uh, Paul-Henri Damiba in the name of national reconciliation. Some skeptics suspect Compaoré of strategizing for a return to Burkina Faso. The Burkina Bay government needs Blaise Compaoré's expertise when it comes to fighting terrorism, but it won't be easy to accept his return on the political scene because the Burkina Bay opinion wants Compaoré to serve a sentence and to apologize. Now, if Compaoré were ever to return, the Burkina Bay government would officially have to pardon him. Civil society groups have already slammed the idea, saying efforts to unite the nation should should not come at the expense of justice. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.